<laughs> so, good evening. I thought up Monday I was going to do a talk today. <laughs> so, I apologize for the relatively unpreparedness of the material. Uh, this is definitely sort of a snapshot of work in progress. Um, I've been playing with this stuff now for about two months. <clears throat> two months ago, I think, I started playing around with um, Alexi Rudol's thesis on propagators. Um, I took one quick stab at it a while back, and then recently revisited the topic, and then started rummaging through everybody's research for ways to make everybody else's research faster. So we'll see um, <laughs> how sticky the ideas are um, as we go. Actually, can we kill the projector for a minute? It'll let it not step in the face while I stand in front of the room. All right. So, wow, that is loud. Can we drop that microphone for a second? Somewhere. Yeah, it is cranked. <coughs> Constantly distracted by the volume of my voice. I'm like everybody else. Okay. So, what is a propagator? Um, <laughs> so, in Alexi's, Alexi wrote, uh, wrote his thesis on the topic, and the short, the sort of short version of it is that you have cells that contain some kind of information, and these sort of um, you can think of them like hyper edges in the graph, or maybe a different kind of node in the graph that know how to send information between these cells. Okay, and what we'll do is this: as the, the cells don't really hold what you'd think of normally as values per se, but we're going to hold all the information we know about a value. Okay, in some vocabulary that we're going to come up with as we go. And the idea here is that as we <coughs> Tell you as these propagators fire, um, they're going to tell you more information about the target cells. So as you gain, in, so as you gain information about your inputs, what's going to happen is you're going to wake up all of the propagators associated with the um, with the cells that it, that it feeds from, and then have those things fire and tell us more information about the output. In order for that to terminate and have and actually always make sense, we need to perhaps go a little bit outside of what the, the thesis said. Um, the thesis was written in, in very general language, um, but it doesn't actually talk about like what do you need for this to terminate, uh, to yield deterministic answers, et cetera. So I want to walk through a number of sufficient conditions for this and see how they give rise to a bunch of different abstractions that we have um, that have been running around since the 70s in different ways. And then we'll see if we can start stealing tricks from each one of those to make the others faster. Um, so, and in the end, I'm going to start ripping apart the contents of these cells and the propagators, and almost nothing will be left of the original vision, but hopefully it will, uh, it will all hang together using this as a substrate. Okay, so how many people here know what a join semi-lattice is? All right, about half. So what I want to do is this. I have, um, I'm going to, to write down, so if I have a monoid, I have an operation that is associative and has a unit, right? And then I can refine that to get like to a commutative monoid. I can add commutativity. So let's just, already screwing up. Let's just break these down and write them out as logs. So I have, Associative, commutative, a unit. Okay, and then we have one last condition, which is that it's idempotent, uh, in order to make this thing a joint semi lattice. Okay, so what is this? This says that M appended with M is M. This gives me that M N is N M. Associativity, we all know. Unit, we all know. Um, I'm, I want these listed out because I'm going to start ripping, they're, they're going to be the, the legs I rip off the centipede as we go. <laughs> um, in different domains, we're going to want to start removing some of them. Okay, so a join semi-lattice can be drawn usually as, a, as some sort of like Haas diagram. 
where you'll have like the bottom of the lattice. And whenever we join two elements, we're going to move up to their uh, least upper bound. So let's just say I have like a lattice that looks like minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. And then if you, if so, if you told me that the value in the cell was one, or you told me it was zero, you'd move up from the bottom state, which is that I know nothing about this, this lattice at all. And I realized I probably should have drawn this higher up on the screen, or on the, on the whiteboard, <laughs> um, given the size of the room. But then what happens if you tell me that the value is both one and negative one? Okay, so the different choices of lattices that we have tell us like what states we're allowed to merge together. So um, for right now, I'm going to put a top on my lattice which will be a sort of contradiction node. In general, we're going to think about the portion of the lattice below the top. The top will be special in almost all the lattices that we're concerned with. It indicates some sort of failure state or contradiction. We've blown up the world. Yes? Sorry to, sorry to theory out on you. Shouldn't we sort of flip it around, make it a meet semi lattice, and then treat bottom as contradiction? Um, it turns out to work. This works out to be the information theoretic ordering if we do this. Okay. So it fits. It fits with your intuition of domain theory if you do it this way. If you take it the other way, then what you're doing. Um, okay. There's there's one scenario in which you want exactly what you just said. Um, but in all the other scenarios, it works out this way, mm -hmm. okay. and you can access everybody else's literature. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I've just never like. You know, normally bottom is the contradiction. So yes, no, normally we're used to thinking of the bottom of the lattice as being my contradiction. However, um, here it's we can become more defined as we move up. Yeah. And at this point in time, we've become too defined, and the world blows up. So it's it's, it's we've wrapped clear around to the other extreme. So Cosmos bottom bottom says that I know nothing about the value. Cosmos bottom isn't the contradiction. It's I didn't give you a value because I never returned. Yes. Well, Although it actually serves both purposes in, in well, no, funny no, ways, but right. having error do that is a hack. Yes. Uh, are the elements in the lattice yeah, uh, possible values, or is the yeah, top of the lattice bottom? Uh, well, there, the elements here will be like the state of the cell at a given point in time. And the idea here is that what I want to have is that my propagator should be monotone functions. So that if you increase the value in some of the inputs, then the output must can only increase in value. All right, so it has to be a monotone increasing function. Um, with respect to the partial order that we get from this joint semi lattice. Okay, so this would be the simplest possible lattice um, that, that is interesting for my purposes here. And um, this has a name, this is basically an I bar, but with a bit of a twist. In the original presentation on I bars, um, you can only tell an IVAR its value once. The modification here is that you can tell an IVAR its value multiple times as long as you always tell it the same value. So um, another name for these things are promises. So an IVAR or a promise, if you start splitting apart the notion of promises and futures, this is the promise side of what, what a future is, which is that it's a, a box that someone will tell me its value. <laughs> And I can, I can fill in, the, I can fill in the, the hole once. But if I ever tried to fill it in twice, I would blow up the world if I gave you contradictory answers. So this is Lindsay Cooper's version of an IVAR when we look at it this way. So I'm going to be trying to steal from a bunch of different people to make, make this go. Um, so the very first chapter of Alexei's thesis talks about this form of lattice, but it's also the notion that it comes out of an I-bar. Um, and, okay, so now we have this, this really simple lattice. We can move to a more interesting lattice. I might have, at the bottom of my lattice, I could have the entire real number line. And then above that, I would have various sub-intervals. Okay, such that what I'm going to do is I'm going to intersect intervals as I gain information about what the actual value is. In this setting, monotone functions are just interval arithmetic. As you tighten the inter input intervals to your interval arithmetic function, the output interval gets tighter. 
Um, in this setting, my lift, I can basically lift an arbitrary normal pure function on just the value line, right? So I can, do, I can define addition here as lifted addition. It takes bottom plus anything to bottom. It takes an actual value plus, any, plus an actual value to an actual value. And take it, we're going to blow up the world before we get to contradictions. Contradictions never, prop, the top never propagates. Or if it, if it does, we're going to consider it as blowing up the entire world. It propagates everywhere, that everywhere becomes a contradiction. Okay, but over here we have this interval arithmetic. So we're going to do something like if I had, I don't know, uh, minus 10 to 50 and 20, uh, 20 to 80, we would join these to get, what, 20 to 50. And these probably should be close intervals. Okay? And if we look at this lattice, there's this sort of nebulous path. I can't really draw the Haas diagram. Um, because these aren't really the, the simplest points in the middle. But if we go all the way up, we're going to get to a point where we're going to have the individual reels here. Is this a, is this a, uh, and the empty interval at the top. Is what you're describing the lattice, is it an infinite lattice, or is it a sampling of the... This is just me sampling from an, from an infinite. This is this is. Or is it, I mean, a sample lattice from the infinite possible one. Yeah, I'm, I'm just drawing a few of the points in in the lattice of all the reals. I can't finish drawing this diagram. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't finish drawing the first one either. So. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, it depends. Uh, uh, like this might be image int, and then I I could get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it might take a while. Yeah, I'd get carpal tunnel or something. Um, so the only ones I can actually draw in the Haas diagram are, are uh, the points. Below that, like you can't put two real numbers next to each other and get an interval. So I don't have anything that's strictly dominated. I have a big cloud down here, minus infinity to infinity up, and then I have this little stretch. But each, each point has like. Oh yeah, there's there, there, there's there, this 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 spans out infinitely just at this level, right? Okay. Well, quite oddly, because they're all floating point numbers. But well, I didn't say floating point. <laughs> I said real. <laughs> you did. Um, yeah, but you still can't represent. Yeah, even with the computable reals, you're going to run into problems. Um, okay, but I want—I actually want—I I need to talk about the size of the lattice here because it's going to—it's going to affect the convergence properties of this propagator network. Okay, so it's not an entirely irrelevant tangent to be rambling on about how big these things are. So I can make, I can make a very strong claim, well, well a, a weak claim to start, which is that if all of my cells had lattices, and those lattices are finite, and I have a finite number of propagators, and all of my propagators are monotone functions, then regardless of the scheduling strategy, this, like, no matter which, as long as every propagator that must fire eventually fires, then this will terminate and yield a deterministic answer. Okay? So that's the first termination condition that I can talk about, is that as long as I have finite lattices, this will always end with a deterministic answer, no matter like how I execute this thing in parallel. Okay, and that was the thing that actually first made me start thinking about this in earnest. Um, that is unfortunately not written up <laughs> in Alexei's thesis. He, he very deliberately thought about monotonicity very, very hard, but never actually wrote up the words. So I get to give him a crap about it now. Um, so that's the first condition. Now, on the other hand, we can actually we can we can make that we can make that a stronger claim in fit in or so, general setting. Really yes. Yeah. When you said deterministic answer, you mean that the network converges somewhere, not that these uh, intervals are. The network, the network, this network will converge. Like, give it if you if you give me a set of starting inputs. But like negative ten to fifty is a deterministic answer. Um, it will it will be a deterministic answer given. Well, this is not a finite lattice. Yeah. Well. Right. This this one fails the condition that I. That I one specified. on integers. <laughs> yes. Uh, that one on inter, That one on. No, ints. Like something small. <laughs> the propagator yes. network can or cannot have loops. It can have it can. loops. Okay. So this one is perfectly, it's perfectly acceptable for me to say, hey, look, now take right, the output right, here right, right. and wire it up backwards. Yeah. Yeah. So that I can say, 
this is a three-way propagator at this point in time. Yeah. If you tell me any two of the inputs, I'll tell you the third. Yeah. Okay, and this will actually become a very important trick for me later. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So so far we have this. We have this this notion that if I have a fi if I have finite lattices and I'm not adding the propagator network, this will terminate. Yeah. On the other hand, if I have just an ascending chain condition, which says that no matter what infinite chain of things you have that continue to go up in the lattice, you eventually hit a fixed point, um, then this also terminates. So I don't need a finite lattice. I need a lattice with an ascending chain condition, okay, which is a bit weaker than the requirements to be like a, like a directed CBO or something. So we don't actually need to have this hold for all sets. We don't have to be a complete lattice. I just need some kind of ascending chain condition. Is that chain complete or is that weaker? Or do you not know? Uh, I can't pull it up off the top of my head. I don't want to speculate wrong. I don't yet. <laughs> so it's a, it's a weaker condition than, or it's a, yeah, it's a weaker condition than being a, a, a directed uh, CPO. Okay, then it's weaker than chain. Yes. Okay. So as long as I have some sort of ascending chain condition, I'm happy. Yes? Um, what if you cannot, uh, cannot compare the cell, the cell values for equality? So you did the join, but you didn't know if, if the value actually changed. So the problem with that is if I, have a, if I have no ability to compare these things for equality, then I would have to fire the propagators coming out of it at every step. Every time I told this thing something, I wouldn't know if it gained any information. <clears throat> right. So we're going to run into a problem there. So I need some sort of decidable, at least decidable increase in information. So that, is, that, that unfortunately makes it so that when you start talking about function spaces of these things, that it starts to break down, right? Okay, so what do we have? So we have two very simple propagator lattices here to begin with. Now, um, appealing back to Alexi's thesis, um, there was a sort of running example in there that was used for a chapter or two on how do you measure the height of a building with a barometer? Has anybody heard this one before? Right? Drop it. That's a very good answer. Um, <laughs> so you go up to the side of the building, you drop the barometer off the side, you see, you measure how long it takes to hit the ground. You could try to measure the pressure differential, but you're going to get terrible error bars on this answer. You could bribe the janitor with it to get the height of the building. You could measure the length of the shadow cast by it on the ground relative to the length of the shadow cast on the building. You can do all sorts of crazy things to try and measure the height of a building with a barometer. Um, as long as you don't consider the barometer a linear resource that you're only allowed to use once um, after you drop it. <laughs> you, you may not be able to do the rest of the experiments. Um, so what you could do is you could lay out your propagator network with all of these different measurements and whatnot and say how they relate to each other. Because as an equation, these things can run both forward and backwards. I just did this with addition. We can do the same thing with multiplication. Um, Certain functions become many valued, and like trying to do sine or square root becomes a little bit tricky. Um, and we start needing the ability to start making guesses. But we'll get there. So we'll, we'll start to get to the point where we can actually do constraint propagation here. Okay. Yes? So what you described doesn't require to be important, is important yet. Doesn't require what? It's I didn't point uh, Oh, wait, no, no, no. Uh, well, you have, you have subtraction there, but that's not uh, item important. Uh, I, it is it is item potent on this lattice. Uh, remember, uh, item potent is on the on the lattice. The lattice themselves are item potent. The function, the propagators are monotone functions. So it just says that if I increase the definiteness of the inputs, then I increase the definiteness of the outputs. Right. So in this setting, it is monotone. Oh, okay. So, so the it's monotone with respect to this lattice that goes up, not that way. Okay, so the inputs are combined uh, at the nodes, not, not at the hyper edges. Yes. Okay. So if I had two here, and you told me three here, um, then what it would do is it would feed this one and this one into here and tell you five, right? And then this gained information, so it would probably try and fire this propagator backwards and tell you information about the inputs. But we already knew that. We already knew that. It'll tell you two. Right? It'll, tell, it'll probably tell you three on the other one. And it'll, but since we didn't gain any information, we won't fire again. Okay. And what, we'll, what I want to do is one of the things I'm going to have to do to try and make this thing scale 
is tackle this problem of all of this sort of thrashing back and forth. It's, we're, we're propagating too much. So what I want to do is start to steal from some other domains for a bit um, after I get through this particular problem. So what happens when we're wrong? When we put error bars on everything and we combine all our answers from all of our different experiments and it says, all right, there's no height that's possible for the building. Um, it would be nice to actually be able to go back and say, well, given the subsets of the experiments, which ones are consistent with each other and which ones give me a tighter bound on the, on the height of the building. Okay, so this turns out to be something called assumption-based truth management, an assumption-based truth management system. It's a thing that goes back to the 70s from the Lisp community mostly, um, back when people used to care about symbolic AI. Huh? <laughs> well, they did. I don't know. Madness of the times. Anyways, um, so there the idea was what we'll do is we'll extend the lattice. We'll extend the lattice here with um, like the power set of all of the assumptions, <laughs> right? Give me a mapping from the power set of my assumptions to my old lattice value. Okay? Oh. Okay. Now, the problem here is we're wasting way too much space. We've turned this, this is like two to the n, right? We've we wasted a factor of two to the n in space. We don't need to waste that much space. We need to waste that much time. <laughs> So we could be smarter about this. We could work with a better lattice. We could do something where what I do is I, I work with like the, the pair, at least just a partial order. I work with the pair of, hey, I'm at version one, and here's the set of things that I'm currently working with. And as I add to the set, I go up. Okay, and then when I have to backtrack because of a contradiction, then I increase this epoch number, and then I start, I backtrack the set appropriately. So by the time we're done, this becomes, we do conflict-directed clause learning here, and we start stealing some techniques from the SAT community, or at least I do. Um, and this gives a way to do a lot of the assumption-based truth management machinery in SAT-like time and space, rather than uh, P-space, or EXP-space, it's even worse, right? It's more ridiculous the way it's normally phrased. Um, so that's a start. So we're going to start rummaging through the um, SAT solver community's um, pockets for well, loose solutions. Let's see what we can let's see what we can steal. Um, how many people here know how a SAT solver works? All right, not as many as the previous question. <laughs> um, one more question: Do you assume the same type of lattice in each cell, or could they be? Oh no! Every cell can be a completely different lattice as long as you have monotone functions that respect the lattices, okay. um, and that that will be that will matter a lot. And as I'm as I go um, before the end of the night, we probably won't even have recognizable cells anymore. So we'll see how how much of this structure remains by the time it gets done bre breaking apart. Um, yeah, this will work. Okay, so what I have is this. Um, a SAT solver finds a, sat, a, a satisfying assignment for Boolean variables for, usually for a problem expressed in conjunctive normal form. So in conjunctive normal form, I have and of a bunch of individual clauses, where the individual clauses are disjunctions of literals, which are x's and values and negated values. Okay, so you could either naively use the De Morgan laws to explode your problem, or you could use the Saiten transformation, or one of these other tools to try and transform an arbitrary Boolean formula into this normal form. And so how does a SAT solver proceed? It guesses. Um, this better not have a not X in there. Let's make that a... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, actually, that would be okay. We can just remove them. Yeah. Um, we, can, we can normalize that. So assume that we normalize a few things out. Um, so here's the, how, how do we proceed? We guess. <laughs> we say, hey, look, x is true. And then all the clauses that have x asserted positively in them are solved. Woo! Right? And let's say that I have another clause over here that has not x in it. Well, naively, what we would do is this. We would just go through and remove that from the clause. Because this is not going to be, every, every 
clause here must be true, this is not going to be the literal in this clause that makes this clause true. So far, so good? So we could remove it. And then once we've removed all the things, if we're down to at any given point in time, there's only one literal left in one of my clauses, what do I do? I know what its value must be. Y must be true. So this is a consequence of X being true. <clears throat> so now I push that through the system. And hopefully I get more things down to one clause, or one literal. And if at any given point in time I had um, not X um, or not Y, <laughs> if at any point in time I get down to something like this, where this didn't hold and this didn't hold, and I'm down to a completely empty clause, we have a problem. We realize the conflict. Okay? This is not part of a complete solution. So what we can do is we can negate this so that we'll never ever try to come back here again. We can get rid of the ones that are just consequences of the previous ones. And this becomes something called conflict-directed clause learning. Um, and what happens is the goal is to make sure that no matter which order we guess other variables, we would never put x and y both being true together ever again. If you tell me x is true, then I'll tell you y is false immediately. Or if you tell me that y is true, I'll tell you x is false immediately. Because we know that it can't, this can never be part of a, a valid solution. Okay, so we're interested in this conflict-directed clause learning as a way to try and minimize the portion of this thing that I need to store. Okay, so if at any given point in time, any subset of this yields a contradiction, any superset, any, anything larger than that will yield a contradiction, so we don't need to store it. Okay, but we're not even going to try and store this, right? We've gotten down to the point where we're gonna try and do this in time, not space. But we don't even have to consider that in our time model as well. And then the second thing is that erasing these things from the sets only to have to put them back in when we backtrack is really expensive. So, what, 15 years ago or whenever ZChaff came around, I, I don't know my set solver timeline very well. That's about when things became viable. ZChaff and Miniset kind of raised the bar. And the two major techniques that they used were conflict-directed clause learning and something called the notion of a two-watched literal scheme. So what is the notion of two-watched literals? Well, all right. Let's say that we're at the moment we need to make a guess. Okay? At this point in time, I can say something about every single clause that's still outstanding that we have to consider. Every single one of them has at least two literals that I have not made assignments to. Because if it had zero, we would be blowing up the world and backtracking. If it had one, we would be doing forward propagation. You would be doing unit propagation. So there are at least two, two literals within each clause that have not been assigned yet a value. So instead of doing something where every time I make an assignment, I have to go find all of the clauses that involve the negation of this thing and remove the, the, the individual thing from there, what I want to do is this. Let's say that I have a clause that has 500 literals in it. I'm not going to write them out. Um, <laughs> then if I watched two of them and didn't care at all about any updates to any of the others, 498 times out of 500, I don't do any work. Okay? The only things I ever do are remove whole clauses whenever I hit a value that is exactly represented there. And it's only when we actually make an assignment to one of the two watch literals that I have to scan through all of the literals to see if they've all had assignments. If everything but this one has had an assignment made, then I should do unit propagation. Because ideally, we just want to touch this thing when, we, when we're ready to do unit propagation. We don't want to touch it all the other times. But what we can do here is if we fail to find, if, if, if we find somebody else who's got a, um, who hasn't yet been assigned a value, I could stop watching this literal and just start watching this one instead. So now we're back into a, liter uh, into a legal scheme where we're watching two of the literals. I don't care which two. So when I backtrack, I don't have to undo this assignment because backtracking is just going to unassign some of my variables. Okay, so the trick here is that we don't have to backtrack this assignment at all. 
So this notion of using a two-watched literal scheme was probably the biggest factor that I know of in terms of making SAT solvers viable in the last 15, 20 years. Yes? So this allows constant space for flaws? Hmm? This allows constant space for flaws? Well, this allows us to avoid um, having to touch every clause that involves every variable that we touch. <clears throat> right? Until, until we're... Basically, if I have 500 variables, I don't care until you've told me 499 things about that clause. That clause only helps me when I'm ready to do unit propagation. So they sort of delay all the work and then and they do it all in one batch. Yeah, rather than what would happen normally is I would wake up every time you change one of my inputs. Yeah. Well, wait a second. That starts to sound familiar. Huh. Yes? How does this handle the situation when you make an assignment that satisfies the clause? When I make an assignment that satisfies the clause, I'm still just removing, I'm just still killing the whole clause. I, like, I have a set of active clauses. Search for this and well, I can maintain an index by uh, polarity of everybody. Right? Like, like give me, like, by literal, where a literal is variable or not variable. Right? Give me a map from that to clauses. Right? And I'll still remove from that map. But I won't remove, I won't be... Um, deleting from the individual clauses. Like if we view these, each clause as a set of literals, I'm not going into each and every set and deleting variables every time. Yeah. Okay. You're so if I have if I have fifty thousand clauses, I will be at, I will be doing fifty thousand items that I'm going to be deleting from this larger outer set. <laughs> but if each one of these had five hundred variables, I don't want to be going into each one of them and deleting from a set of five hundred things or something like that. You can also do the clause deletion lazily. Yes. You can be smarter about that too. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you can also do the clause deletion more lazily, um, but we're going to skip that part. So if we view this as sort of the set of assignments that I'm making, and I put a little epoch number out in front of this, I can put an order on my current variable set and work through this in a very lattice theoretic sense, like we were doing on the um, not on the back of this board. On the stuff I just erased. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so, um, let's turn this back into a propagator problem. Okay, or at least start to see some things that we can say about many propagator problems. So what I'm interested in is this. I have some propagator network, and most of my propagators have this interesting property that Whenever they're given bottom, they yield bottom. If all of their inputs are bottom, or I'll say all but one of them, let's say, yeah, well, if, if, if any of their inputs are bottom, then they yield the bottom. Okay? So we go back to our, our original lattice where we had bottom, and then we had values, um, you know, minus one, zero, one, two, da da da, top. And I had my addition propagator here. If they're not, that argument's irrelevant. Or is that? If, if, if they're not, then we're going to have to use something else. Okay. This is going to be um, a way to slow down the amount of propagation I have to do right. for most propagators. Right. So if you have A plus B equals C, and you don't know anything about A, then it doesn't matter what you know about C. You're not learning anything exactly. about C. OK. In this setting, this is fully bidirectional, right? I can actually, because we have that, the minuses coming back and all this other stuff, right? We can view this as one propagator that says, given two out of these three things, I will tell you the third. Well, what, is, what, was, the propagate, what was the problem when we were talking about SAT? Given 499 out of the 500 things, I will tell you the 500th. Okay? So what I want to do is this. I want to watch two of my cells as if they were literals. I want two watched cells here. This is for addition. Well, we can do a one watched literal scheme when I have something that's not fully symmetric like this. So if you have a sum of 500, 500, 499 variables giving you a 500th, if you tell me any 499 of them, I can tell you the, 500, the, the missing one. Um, and if I go to that interval, that interval arithmetic thing, I can start to tell you something. <laughs> Only once I've got everybody off of the bottom of the lattice. Probably not too much, but I can tell you something. Um, so I want this sort of slow start. I want to wake up my propagators 
um, using a two watch literal scheme. Basically, for any propagator that's of this sort, like the addition propagator, that's this three way thing. I'm just going to draw this as a addition with inputs and say which one is the, is the uh, output, you know, that way. Then what I want to do is whenever I get to, um, I'm going to maintain a set, a, a pair of these that I'm watching. And if I, whenever I make an assignment to the one that I'm watching, then I have to go check all of the other ones to see if they're all, if they're non-bottom. And if so, then I will propagate into the last one. Otherwise, I will start watching another literal. Okay. So this is the first scheme that I have here for trying to reduce the amount of firing that's going on in my propagator network. Yes? So is the fact that, the, that your propagators all pass, take bottom to bottom one of the laws that you're... It's not necessarily a law. This will, I will only be able to do this for propagators of that sort. Other propagators will have to continue to fire as normal. Um, this just turns out to be a very remarkably common property of propagators. Um, so just like these, these are the conditions that I, I said before about my cells. I'm a, it's going to be occasionally useful for me to um, talk about conditions that don't always hold, but that um, will sometimes hold. Now this is on my propagator side, so this is technically on a different list. Okay. So far, so good. So we can use two watch literals to wake up a propagator. But unlike a, um, when we're talking about Boolean formulas, once you've given me that X is true, X will never refine anymore. Here, on the other hand, it can continue to move up. But it can't keep moving up indefinitely if we have an ascending chain condition or something like that. It will eventually reach a fixed point. We'll stop. So what I'm interested in is this. When is it just before it's going to go up anymore? or when, when it can't go up anymore. Because we have this contradiction note at the top of our lattice, and we said the contradiction is going to be special. It's overdefined. We're going to blow up the entire world whenever you tell me that x is both 2 and 3. We don't like contradiction. Um, so if I, if I had an input here that was at 2, and this one was at 3, can this propagator, and, and I've actually fired this propagator to tell you this is 5, can this propagator ever fire again? If I increase this, the only way I can increase it is to go up the top, in which case I blow up the world. Right? Everything here is a DEF CON 1. Right? Any little thing will set it off. It won't, <laughs> it won't, go, it won't go any higher. So what I can do is this. I can use another two-watch literal scheme to put the propagator to bed. Once... The propagator, once my, all of the inputs to my propagator are right below top, which we can, we can define, there's a notion of a covering relationship, that X is covered by Y if um, there doesn't exist anything in the middle between X and Y. Like, this can't exist. But those are the ones that we draw in the Haas diagram when we, when we draw out a lattice. Okay? So, if X is covered by top, the contradiction node. And if, so if all of my inputs are covered by, by top, let's say that this is a directed thing rather than an undirected thing, or all but one of them in the two watch literal kind of setting, <laughs> then once this propagator fires, it will never fire again. I can remove the propagator from the network without changing the answers. So this is the start of a garbage collection scheme for these things. OK? Um, now I want to start rating other people's stuff for parts. <laughs> um, so we have two watch literals for wake up and putting it to back to bed. Um, all right, so now we talked about I bars and promises, at least I bars in the Lindsay Cooper sense. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna rate some of her other stuff. So Lindsay has these things she calls L bars. And an L bar. It's a joined semi-lattice. Who's surprised? Okay. And what, what she does is she lets you write code that can fork and can read and write to LVARs, but whenever it writes to an LVAR, it's going to basically write a value that's going to be, it's going to 
it's going to be basically writing a value into the lattice, which will merge with whatever value is already there. So that will be per force a monotone increasing function. But then she only allows you to read from her lattice variables in a very special way. So what she does is this. If you had a lattice, let's say that we had, I don't know, um, I don't know, let's do false, but I don't know anything about this side. Or it's true, but I don't know anything about this side. Unfortunately, T is a very bad choice of letter here. <laughs> um, <laughs> bottom, false, bottom, true, 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 false, 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 true, lowercase true, false. Eh, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to use. I'm not going to draw the top. Zero. Yeah, right, above that we go to top. So, um, so what do we have here? We have. Um, this goes up here, and then we go from true to that, or to that. False can go to there or there. Bottom or false can go to there or there. There should be two up from everything, right? So there and there, right? This is our lattice. For, let's say that I wanted to compute and. When do I know the value of and? Well, I know the value of and whenever I'm in this setting or whenever I'm in, the, in this setting. Okay? And so what she does is this. She describes things in terms of these upward closed sets. Okay? Which is a filter on the um, partial order if, if you're more comfortable with the um, more anal retentive vocabulary here. And what we're, what, what we're going to do is we have a series of disjoint filters, so upward closed sets that are disjoint, and we'll give you an assignment of a value for each one of them. And these things act like traps, because everything is monotone increasing. Every move that we can make in this lattice moves us upward. And we're already commutative and associative and all these nice things. So there's no way to get out of this trap and into the other one. Okay, so if you if you are destined to land in this bin, you can't fall in this bin <laughs> afterwards. You can't get it wrong because of a scheduling problem. So now what we can say is this: that if, if we have the if we have these upward closed if we have these filters on my um, data set, then what I can do is I can block until I fall into one of these traps and then unblock with the answer. And this gives me a sort of deter this. This gives us a, a model with fork and join, threshold reads, and arbitrary writes, as long as they're to a lattice variable, that will always yield deterministic answers. Now we have a fork join graph, which is not what we had with the propagator story. The propagator story, what we have is that every time we make an increase, I'm going to fire the propagator. Here, I'm only interested in when I cross these sort of critical thresholds, right? These are the moments when this will fire. And it will never fire again. It's a one-shot thing. So this is the notion of a threshold read. And it turns out that we can implement most of the propagator machinery with threshold reads. So there's a, there's a, a nice synergy between these, these techniques. And as a matter of fact, I can tear apart the threshold read stuff and implement it with more propagators. So, but <laughs> We'll, um, I don't, what, my goal here today is to start to establish that we don't need all of this machinery <laughs> after building it up, right? I wanna, I wanna establish what we wanna model and then see if we can make it out of simpler pieces. And some of this is stuff that I'm still working on, some of it, like, I believe that there is a, a smaller subset of these lattices that are interesting that we can build the rest of them out of. I don't have, I don't have the full answer set yet, but it's getting there. Okay, so where are we at? We have these upward closed sets. Every, every function that, is, that just does threshold reads and does whatever arbitrary write that they want to do to a lattice variable is automatically monotone. It does nothing below this point, and then it gives you an answer. Which is at least better than, at least nothing. <laughs> right? And it can't give you a different answer as you move up higher in the lattice. So every function that just does threshold reads is automatically monotone. It automatically passes the laws that I want to bolt on top of the propagator machinery. So I'm pretty happy with that. 
And the other thing is, is that nothing here requires these things to be idempotent. If we're not working inside of a propagator, I don't actually have to be idempotent. What I need is that my, uh, my rights have to be inflationary. Whenever I change a value, I have to move upward in the lattice. And that my rights have to be able to commute with each other. Right? Um, she doesn't actually stick them together at any given point in time, so she doesn't really use these laws either. She talks about them, but she doesn't use them really. Like, if you look at an L-bar, it's basically a glorified channel with a value stuck to the side of it. Um, and then, basically, it's listening to the individual updates that are coming down the channel to, to right, right, right. do a thing. Okay. Um, so I'm starting to deconstruct the notion of an L-bar because I think that an L-bar does too much work, and so does the propagator machinery. Um, so far, so good. So we have threshold reads. as a nice primitive. What else can we steal from other, other communities? Um, how many people here know data log? Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, uh, so by threshold reads, you're just talking about when it, when it crosses the threshold? You know? Yeah, you have a threshold. A threshold read is you give me a set of upward closed sets, mm -hmm. a, a set of filters with values associated with each filter. As long as the filters are disjoint, um, when you cross that threshold, I give you the answer that you associated with the filter. Yep. So I know there was some work, uh, it's called epidemic algorithm, that's propagating things through a network uh, design. It was intended for distributed systems. But we, can, we can talk about gossip, Okay. Um, which gives you a form of eventual consistency, Okay. Um, which can be modeled in terms of something called a CRDT. Yep. And if you start using, um, there's two forms of conflict-free replicated data types. There's convergent replicated data types, which are saying, hey, here's a lattice, go nuts. Yeah, okay. And when you, when you talk, yeah, exchange yeah. your lattices, lattices, and then you're immediately in the same state, and you get a strong eventual uh -huh. consistency condi condition. And there's another thing called um, a CMRDT, or commutative RDT. Okay. And a commutative RDT says, we're going to rely on delivery guarantees and stuff to make sure that everything happens exactly once. And they drop the item potence condition. Uh -huh. <laughs> and model it with better protocol guarantees and get closer to the LVAR story. So if we, if we look at them, one of them feels a bit propagator-ish and one of them feels a, bit, a little bit LVAR-ish. And that's a little hand-wavy, but I'm just trying to get, I was going to get to CRDTs later if I have time. I don't know if I'm going to. Yes? Um, am I, I might be just interpreting this crazily, but the threshold reads are giving you like a sleep condition, right? Once you pass the threshold read, you don't have to ever worry about this again. Yes. But you still have to propagate the partial information you get before the threshold, or are you also skipping that out? Well, what we can do is this. Um, I could, let's say that each one of these is a, each, each one of these is a very simple Boolean lattice, a, a, little, a little lattice where I have this. Bottom, false, true, contradiction. Right, I'm just not going to even, I don't even include the top of my lattice, right? The lattices are, are topless. Um, okay, let's just, any, anytime, you, like, we're going to make join a partially defined operation. Anything that, like, is undefined goes to top. Okay, just make it, make it a lattice under that addition. Okay, so now what I can do is I have two of these, right? What I'm interested in doing is being able to read from a pair. Of, of these things at threshold. Okay, so, I, so what I could do is this. I could, I could actually model this with very simple just IVAR reads, right, which there's an implementation of IVARs where IVAR reads look like pure function calls. There's an IVAR SA to A computation, okay. right? You can read from it as a pure call. You'll just block until it, yeah, it gives back an answer. Um, so what I want is to build, let's say that we have two of these things. And I want, I'm going to build an output variable. Well, what do I want to do? The moment you tell me, like, I, I want to block with one computation that says, hey, look, whenever I go above that, scribble in here false. I block here with another computation that says, whenever I go above that, scribble in here false. Then I write another computation that says, hey, block here waiting for this to be true come down here, block here waiting for this to be true, and if you get there, then come here and write this. Each one of these is a very simple IVAR read 
thing on a very simple lattice, right? So we can build this sort of composite out of simpler reads and writes, um, just by being more clever in the construction of our LVAR. We can avoid the need for actual LVAR-ish computations. Yes. Um, if you build it in the, out of these small pieces, um, aren't you losing the ability to uh, to use the two watch cells trick again? Uh, potentially. Um, on the other hand, these are not propagators. These are uh, these are, these do a single threshold read. Um, so I don't actually know if I can do. I could do a. Here I would need to know that this only actually starts taking on values once both things are defined. But it's not actually when both things are defined here, right? When one of the values is defined, I can start firing. Yes, but aren't you going to have two functions down there? One in case um, your first variable was defined first, and the second... Yes, I wind up having to fork off two threads. Under, under the LVAR model, what I do is I fork. One thread does a read here with and both each of those Each of those threads has, has the possibility of knowing what variables it's watching for. Yes, but in this case, it's... it's what we're going to do is this. Whenever I do any change here, it's going to go from bottom to something. So that becomes an actual. That becomes immediately relevant to this particular threshold read, right? For an IVAR, the lattice is so simple that there's not much room for optimization. We go from nothing to the actual answers to oh crap, I blew up the world, and there's nothing in between, right? So if we looked at it from the standpoint standpoint of two watch literals, right? Any right to this that moves us will necessarily be the only right that ever moves us because you can never move up any higher without blowing up the entire world. So an IVAR doesn't really benefit from the machinery. It's only when you have a more interesting lattice. So far so good? Uh, we, we can take more of that offline, I think, if, if you're not fully convinced. <laughs> um, so we have some machinery for doing this in Haskell, actually. Um, but I'll have to get back to that. Let's see here. So what do we have? We have threshold reads are automatically monotone. Um, I'm starting to try and take apart the notion that we should have the entire lattice as a thing that we wake up everybody who's listening to us when we make a change to it. So in the CRDT world, which came up when we were talking about distributed systems, just a little bit, there's a number of these kinds of lattices that people use. Um, one of them is these notions of just growable sets. If you have a set of variables and you're only allowed to add to the set, a set of values and you're only allowed to add to the set. This is a lattice. We can union to merge things together and move up in the lattice. Um, that would be a G set in the parlance of uh, CRDT folks. So with a global set, if I'm watching, like there, there's, there's a couple of kinds of thresholds that I might hit. Has the set reached 50 members? Is Bob in the set? Like, those are the kinds of things that we might do threshold reads on. There's not much else that we can really do exclusively. Um, so I would argue that in many ways it would be better to break apart that particular LVAR into lots of little LVARs, whereas you have the map that says, hey, look, I'm watching for Bob here. Oh, and Bob, Bob has this value, which is, look, he's, he, gone, he went from defined to, yes, he's here. <laughs> Right, he's just a little toggle switch. Or we have a listener who's down there listening for Bob. Right, not watching the whole set for every change and then filtering out a whole bunch of irrelevant nonsense. So a finer grained propagator network is actually much better for me in this sense. Like breaking things down in this regard, let me avoid waking up spuriously for input I don't care about. So the first couple of things we, we started tackling was you know, how do we avoid waking up at all until we broke this threshold. But then if I can break apart the LVARs and, and put like a vector clock here where I have a, a map where the values inside of them are also lattices, um, then what I can do is I can, lit, I can go in, listen on the individual component that I want, 
and then go from there. So if I wanted to do those two different kinds of reads, what might I do? Well, if I had two different kinds of very simple primitive, almost like almost brutally primitive, like Ivar-like and maybe a counter that unlocks once you've reached a certain threshold that's only increasing, then what I could do is I could make more efficient propagators out of, or more efficient LVARs out of these more interesting, build, or simpler building blocks. So like for the threshold set, perhaps it's best to say, hey, look, I have my integer counter, and then what I have is like a heap off to the side where I put the listeners in it with what threshold they activate at. When do they start caring? And then whenever I make an update here, I just keep pulling, extracting them in from this um, heap until we've reached the current point. And then we stop it, we stop telling people. So now what we're doing is instead of waking everybody up, we're waking people up at a, at a, at a predefined threshold. Here we're using a heap to govern the properties. Um, here we're breaking it down and sending them down into the structure. Yes? The heap deleted, right? like, in this case, like the heap there was like that I have a counter, right? It's at 50 here, and this guy doesn't want to wake up until it's at 600. <laughs> right? And so there's just nothing in the heap that's less than 50. So if I bump this counter, which remember doesn't require item buttons because we're in Elvar land, so I can just add 10 to the counter, then anything here in this set that was below that threshold we pull it off, we tell this listener, hey, proceed, do what you're going to do, your value is currently 60. And maybe it pushes this thing down, like to 61, or something like that. Tells, so it says, wake me up immediately the moment you know anything more. Maybe it pushes it way further down. Or maybe it fires off, hey, I have to contract this other interval somewhere else. Uh, so what does the counselor represent? Hmm? What does the counselor represent? But let's say that I wanted to have like a, a, a growable set and I, I want to wake up whenever the global set's at, at 500 members. Okay. Then what I could do is I could build the global set out of two components. One is a counter with a heap, and the other one is, say, a linear probing hash table <coughs> where I put in either listeners or um, indicators saying that the values are there. So it's ordered by the threshold hierarchy. Yes. In this case, it, this, yeah, in this case, it's ordered by the fact that we have, a, we have this very sim similar, simple chain, right? Yeah. Or zero, one, <laughs> one, two, three, four, et cetera, right? And then you have thresholds that look like this. Yes? Oh. Would, would it be saying, is, is, am I right to say what you're kind of proposing here is that you wanna, when you're composing propagators, you're asking to propose, you're asking the downstream propagator or whatever needs to pass back information about its thresholds at the same time the um, upstream one is passing values down to it. Because it feels a lot like topological systems at this point where you have the two directions. Yeah, we do have some information coming back from the propagator to the um, to the the lattice variable, right? The, yeah. um, the cell that we have. In this case, the threshold and when we're going to wake up. Right? Um... And for the most part, like for my monotone functions for these things, it's just like, hey, you wake up the moment you go above bottom, right? Or you, you tell me the moment you're at the top so I can start to put this thing to bed and remove it from the network entirely. Yeah. All right. So what do we have? We have two watch literals. We have threshold reads. We have these um, more interesting parts so that we can actually get dedicated schemes for things like these global sets or the like. Um, another one is, if I could go like steal some almost like finger tree like stuff for how to wake up all the propagators that are listening. So I have to tell you who's listening, right? Because you have to know who you're going to wake up. And I can tell you, I, I know when the last time they woke up was. Um, so let's go rummage around in data log for a minute <laughs> for how we make an efficient data log and steal that for all of our other propagators. So how many, uh, So just a handful of people knew what data log was. So, so data log is, is bottom-up prolog is one way to think of it. Um, so I have some kind of relationship like Bob, the parent of Bob is Nancy and the parent of Dave is Nancy or something like that. I should maybe, parent of Nancy. 
just, that's yes, no. Um, <laughs> Dave, right? And then what I can do is, given these sort of, this is what they call the extensional database, I can make little IDB predicates, which look like this. Say, um, if you tell me parent XY, then ancestor XY. And if you tell me, I don't know, let's do, we can get ancestor XZ from ancestor XY and parent XZ. Okay, this would be the way you write these rules. Huh? Uh, yeah, I should say YZ. Yeah. All right, yes. Okay. So this would be a very stupidly simple data log program. Now let's think about this as, so data log, these things act like tables, okay? And what we're doing here is basically a join. And we're scribbling the contents from this join into this table, which will give me some kind of change that I'm going to feed back through the same thing until it terminates. If you put certain syntactic restrictions in place, this will always terminate in finite time, yielding a deterministic answer, regardless of scheduling strategy. Um, <laughs> okay, as a matter of fact, um, we can steal something from Joe Hellerstein called the CALM principle. Um, and the, the CALM principle says that if you can write it as a uh, data log program, that it terminates and has these nice properties and is deterministic, and if you, and then there's a dual to the state, like it actually says if and only if. It's a, it's a conjecture, CALM conjecture, so it's not actually a... a it's, <laughs> But it takes a lot of these sort of, hey, look, if I can phrase the propagator story as an instance of this, uh, if, I can, if I can phrase the data log story as an instance of this propagator story, it says, it says something very strongly about how universal the propagator story is. Um, so what do I want to steal, steal here? Um, so the naive evaluation strategy here is that this is my propagator arrow, right, going this way. From these inputs, I will yield this output. And we're doing, we're specifying how we're doing this together. We're joining information. So as you add rows to the input tables, I add rows to the output tables. Now we don't have a finiteness condition. We don't have an ascending chain condition here natively. What we have is that we only have a finite set of values here to start with, and we have nothing that ever generates new names. So we kind of get it from the side. It's another sufficient but not necessary condition for termination. Here we're not doing it on an individual lattice basis, we're doing it on a global systems basis. And we can build this out as a propagator network, and we can draw the same kind of network we did before, where I was using two different kinds of nodes. We, had, we started with a hypergraph to describe these things. And then I kind of redrew it as a graph with two different, like a bipartite graph with two different kinds of nodes. So let's call this like rule one and rule two. And I might have two tables, P and A. So what do we have? Rule one says that the parent table feeds into rule one and gives me table A. And then rule two says that the parent table feeds into rule two, and then we both read and write to A. So if we're looking for a good evaluation order for my propagator network, what we can do is steal from the data log folks two things. One is that you should evaluate this stuff in topological order. You should look for the strongly connected components and evaluate this graph in order. This is saying I should dump from the parent table into the ancestor relation, and then what I should do is run this, loop, this rule over and over and over again until it stops. Okay? If I don't finish this dump, this does nothing for me. <laughs> right? And the other one is this. That they upgrade this. They don't just talk about, hey, let's take the entire ancestor relationship and join it against the entire parent relation. If I have 50 million ancestor relationships and a million parent relationships, that's a really big join. I don't want to pay for it over and over again just because I added two ancestors at this step. What I'm really interested in is doing is doing this. Compute you know, delta A1 and give me an output delta A. And then join this, join the delta to the ancestors against the parents. So what I'm interested in is what has changed since the last time I fired this propagator? So now the lattice story starts to break down. And Eli left the room. 
right in time for me to mention how this is the moment where the thing that he wanted is right. Uh, <laughs> um, which is that if we were to flip our lattice over and we had a meat lattice, then this would be a, we would be looking for like a, a pseudo-complemented lattice. Okay? Uh, where what we're doing, what we're interested in is saying, how do I get down to an, like what's the arrow down from A to B? Tell me just the delta I need to get down there. So A arrow B becomes another object that I, when I join it with A gets me down, or when I meet it with A gets me down to um, B. That would be X, and it would be the least or greatest, would it be the greatest one. Or whatever. There's a nice universality for it. Uh, technically, we wind up being co pseudo complemented if we do it the other way around. And co pseudo complemented semi lattices are not a thing that inspires a, a great deal of interest from. The larger community. Yes? So would those, those be values covered by the threshold? Um, these would be, how to put it? What I'm interested in saying is this. If, I, if, if I've, the last time I propagated fire that was here, right? Now I'm here. Give me a very succinct description of just this path, not the entire point, right? I'm just interested in like the delta in my, in my. For example, in your, your case where each of these is a, a well. You have a list of variables, a uh, list of triggers. Like yes, uh, back when it was Bob, mm -hmm. you want to know what items were added to that list. Exactly. What what new what new records do I have in the ancestor relationship since the last time I, I fired? And this might not like. So by the time you get done here, this ceases to be that my cells are actually lattices, but more that I have some partial order. I don't care what it is. So as long as I have a partial order for my cells, and then I have some kind of commutative monoid that acts on that partial order that, with inflationary updates, so that I have the commutativity of it is done in the monoid, um, then what I'm looking for is the sort of best representation of that monoid. Give me the simplest monoid that has the same effect. So let's, let's go back to the, the original example here. I have 50 million rows in the ancestor table. You've given me 40 new rows, but actually only five of them made it through. Tell me the five that made it through. Okay. Right? Get me the filter. <laughs> Get me, or not the filter in the, the math sense, but the, like the, the filtered version of the, of the monoid. Give me an M prime that's related to the original M that has the same action on the same starting state. Okay. And once we have that notion, now we can actually borrow the data log vocabulary here. This, this becomes semi-naive evaluation of data log. Get, keep track of the delta since the last time we fired the individual rule. Fire the rules in topological order. And what we've done is we've given you a scheme that maximizes the size of the deltas that we're running with. And that means that if I won't give you a delta that has four rows in the ancestor table and then another a delta that has four rows. I'll try to give you a, del a delta of eight rows if I can. If it's possible to do it in topological order, I will. Okay, and that way we can fuse together the paths when we're doing the join. Okay, so originally we said that every evaluation strategy will yield a deterministic answer. Now what I'm doing is I'm looking for evaluation strategies that are cheaper. Okay, so now what we have is semi-naive data log. Um, just rephrased in terms of lattices rather than in terms of actual tables. So an arbitrary monotone function on a lattice. Or the, the lattice has now been replaced with a partial order being acted on by a commutative monoid. Well, commutative idempotent monoid, so it's actually being acted on by a lattice. But whatever. If we're working with a propagator story. Um, and we can break this apart. We can replace idempotence with distributivity, but I don't want to go into that just yet. Um, that's a whole other talk, I think. Um, so what do we have? So now we've stolen one implementation technique for making data log fast. And then the other one was is that once we've done this topological order, we can make other kinds of edges in the graph. So I think early on I said that it was, pos it was legal for us to always put cycles into our graph. I think you asked about that at the beginning. And what if I added a type of edge where you can't make a cycle through it? 
So this lets us do things for, in data log terms, this is for stratified negation is usually where it's applied. Where you're allowed to say something like, to avoid the barber paradox of, you know, Kevin the barber shaves all the people, all the men in the town who don't shave themselves, you know, with the, where the solution is, of course, that Kevin's a woman. Um, to avoid this paradox, um, what we can do is you can't have Kevin the barber be drawn from the same set that Kevin is reasoning about. So it gives us a sort of stratification of our universes. So if we have sort of extra edges that have these sort of slashes through them that are just not allowed to participate in any cycle, and any time they do, we blow up the world with a contradiction. Um, we can use stratified data log to allow us to have these sort of not, uh, seemingly non-monotone edges added to our graph. Okay, where we can reason about there is nobody in the ancestor relationship who is an ancestor of Bob. Or Bob has no descendants. Let's do that. <laughs> um, it would have to be Adam. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have Adam and Steve and nobody else. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Now, the, I like stratified negation because there's like aggregation can also be done the same way. Like if you want to add up a bunch of things in a data log relation, you can do stratified aggregation on these sort of funny edges. You could reason about the space of there is no variable assignment for a thing. So the, this lets me start talking about sub-propagator problems as a lattice in their own right. So, <laughs> so let's squint at the lattice that we're talking about, or the, the graph that we're talking about in the first place as a lattice. Let's try to do it as a lattice on its own. Where did I put the... There it is. I just dropped it, that's all. So we can actually make some observation. And given our original lattice, if I have the same propagator twice, what happens? We get a less efficient evaluation strategy, but it doesn't change the answer. Propagators are idempotent. Or the updates to the cells are idempotent the ones that we're allowed to do from a propagator. So if I were to add the same propagator twice to this network, it wouldn't change the answer. So if we squint at the graph itself that we're using as our propagator network, our propagator network itself forms a lattice. Okay, And we can add propagators to the network, which is just potentially making the lattice more defined in, certain, in the presence of certain inputs. Right? As we crank up some of the inputs, some of our other outputs become more defined, or perhaps it immediately launches us to more definedness if we don't have this F at the bottom, this bottom condition. So this notion of using the propagator network itself as a lattice where I add threshold reads, which are monotone functions, which are more propagators, um, works out as a very nice implementation strategy for all of this. But we have a problem. Now this topological order is changing. Okay. <laughs> so we have a problem. Like Tarjan gave us an algorithm for evaluating an O, N plus M time, a um, compute the topological order of a graph. Computing the change, of, or change the, the, the new topological order in the presence of a change is actually really expensive for a directed graph. If you're just working with connected components, it's really cheap. So things like, if we look at the addition node, that, that one had the nice property that was kind of fully bidirectional, right? Everything updates everything. These we can mash together using union find-like tri tricks, and the bound goes to like, you know, n alpha n or, or alpha n for each update. It's, it's pretty and fun. Um, over here, every update is O square root of n. <laughs> Okay. What about retroactive data structures? Well, they don't actually help. Uh, I tried it. Um, but it's not as bad as it sounds at first. Okay, so there's some papers that are actually very recent within the last couple of years where they talk about how to maintain a dynamic um, topological order in the presence of modifications. And one way to think about it is this. What I'll do is I'll maintain... Um, something called an order maintenance structure, which for all intents and purposes is a linked list that I can compare for members being before or later than each other in the list in O1. Um, 
there's an implementation of it on my GitHub account. Um, it's one of those nice little magic building blocks to the structures. <laughs> and what they do is this. They allow you to add edges that, that agree with the order. But whenever you add a back edge here, we have to kind of scan forward and backwards from here to make sure that the total order that I gave you, like I'm going to have to rearrange some of this, <sighs> collapse, maybe collapsing some of my nodes together into a strongly connected component. But it's what, only when I add these back edges that I have to care about it at all. And it only invalidates the portion of the total order that's affected there. So any work that I'm doing on the, on the ordering that's outside of that set isn't dirty, and I can still use it. And if I can accumulate square root of n of those kind of updates or something like that, then I can afford to do the Tarjan thing all over again before I have to touch the dirty region. And then I can play other games to try and model the costs so that if I do something that's in the dirty region but doesn't involve one of these slashed edges, I'll just like pay into a bin credit for rebuilding or potentially have to do these steps. Um, and if I ever have to cross a, a slashed edge, then I have to make sure that that order is done right. Yeah. Because otherwise I'm just completely wasting work. So with all of that, we can start talking about this topological order. Is there some strategy for adding, changing the, the propagator graph that maintains the order so you, you don't have to update it all? It's just... Well, I mean, a lot of it is, like, if you tell me, like, the, the sort of the passive edges that will be there, right. like, if you can freeze the propagator network, then I can know that I don't have any of these costs, right? I can just have, like, passive and active versions of edges and stuff like that. Because the deletion only or the addition only versions of these problems, like, unfortunately, this is, I'm just doing incremental. Um, the incremental or decremental are the, the two terms for the, 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 the limited set problems where you're only allowed to dynamically add them. So I'm only doing incremental, and the incremental only version is this. The decremental version is cheaper. It, just, it seems like if I replace, if I can guarantee you I replace nodes with expanders, for example, that that you should be able to just keep the order. Yes, you, you and in many of the cases, in many of the cases here, like if I use propagators as an implementation strategy for other propagators. Right, okay. Or if, I, if I use threshold reads as an implementation strategy for propagators that logically subsume them, then I don't have to do any of this top right, right, crazy right. topological stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes? The partial ordering is on the deltas, right? The partial ordering is uh, on the, the deltas act on the set. So I have, a, I, have a, I, have a, I have some monoid that describes what I'm going to do, right? Like insert this, insert that, or you know, insert it, these names, right? Then over here I have the set, which may have a larger vocabulary. So I have S over here, I have M that wants to act on S. So I have a function from M to S to S, which we'll call like act. Right? This is the action of M on S. So this is a partial order, and this action must be a monotone function. It must, or it must be inflationary. It must take, act M must take, act M of S must be greater than or equal to S. Okay. Hmm. okay. Let's, let's wander away from these problems for a bit and look at something more interesting. Catch you before you wander away. Yes. Could you repeat what the name of that uh, order preserving list data structure was? Order preserving list. The one with the backward and forward. Order file maintenance. maintenance. Oh, um, this is this is um, an order maintenance structure. Yeah. Okay. Order if you look at um, GitHub Ecomat structs, oh, okay. which will fortunately will be recorded on this video, so you'll be able to find it. Um, GitHub Ecomat structs has an order maintenance and a list ma uh, list labeling solutions, okay. um, and link cut trees and a bunch of other things that I needed for other things. So it turns out that if you use an order maintenance structure here, you can get rid of most of the costs. And then if I special case the totally connected component costs, I can get those down to alpha n. And then the other one that comes up when we start talking about constraint propagation are trees, and I can make those cheap by sort of doubling down on the cost of the order maintenance structure. So I've been trying to figure out if I can handle this with bounds that are, say, a, a factor of two worse than they would be for a perfectly dedicated strategy, but never pathologically, asymptotically worse. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm hunting for sort of a too optimal evaluation strategy in terms of uh, approximation algorithm terms. 
Um, I'm not quite there yet. That, that's where this, this talk caught me a bit underprepared. Is that going to happen in struts or is that happening? That's happening currently. Um, I have code in three different repositories. Right. One's named Propagators. I started there. Um, and that has a very, very naive implementation of the propagator machinery. Um, but it has one kind of cute tool that I haven't duplicated in the others. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't I throw something up on the projector here for a minute? And you can actually look at this as code rather than diagrams. See if this will come back, come back up. Ooh. All right. So here, this was a very literal implementation. So I have a cell that currently contains maybe a value, right? So bottom was specially handled in this. Um, and what to do when this value changes. It didn't have any ability to delete. And how do I merge into the changes? So if you tell me an A, how do I merge it with the value that I already have? And the change will tell me whether that actually caused me to move up in the lattice. All right, so this is a very ad hoc, like just sort of a quick implementation. So we can build a merge that like uses like a merge from a class by default, or we can make an explicit one. Um, you can give a cell that already has a starting value. And then what I have are these little combinators that we can use inside of our propagators. One does a write to a cell, which moves us upward. Um, one watches a cell, which installs a listener that fires every time the cell changes with this value. And then um, this is like a read, but then um, only do this action if the actual value was there. So I have, uh, let me see if I can, I can get to something that's maybe more interesting. So for doing num-like things, what I wanted to do was this. I built the basic propagator network with cells and these um, propagators between them. But then I built this sort of prop data type, which builds expressions. So I wanted to be able to do things like write, I don't know, let's go down here. Um, ah, wrong size, go bigger. Okay, um, I want to be able to do uh, C is, you know, C times, let, let's take C times 9 over 5, you know, plus 32, and then run this equation but forward or backwards. And why can we do that? Well, if we go to that really naive propagator that we started with, I can build for each one of those arithmetic expressions a sort of symbol tree of what I want to do, recover it as a graph using observable sharing, and then whenever I have a thing that involves two inputs and one output, I can kind of draw in the propagator network that I want. Let's put my plus node from you know, these two nodes together going into this one and the minus coming back. Right, so I, I stitched together these little graphs to build a propagator network out of an expression. So this says um, what we have is like a Fahrenheit cell and then we have like a we have a minus here, 32, which gives me this value, which we then multiply by. I don't know. Was it? Uh, well, we multiply by five coming in one way, and then we uh, get this value, and then we multiply by nine in the other direction. You have to put the correct orientation on the arrows, and we get Celsius over here. <laughs> so by the time we're done. If I feed in a value on either end of this network, it will push through because we know enough values to get the answer on the other side. Unfortunately, this is a very bad propagation scheme because it has no guarantee that it will that it's like complete, that it gives you the, the actual answer. So this was the, the, the scheme that I started with, but I'm not a big fan of it. Because it, I'll give you an example of something where it's weak. If I did backwards, where I said C goes to C plus C. It looks like I have two unknown inputs. It doesn't know that it should try and rewrite that into like two times C, where two is a known, and either the output or the input, the other input would be known. 
right? So that's a more defined propagator. If we look at the propagator network itself as a lattice, um, that would be increasing the definition. That would be moving upward. Okay, so I built this one first, and I wasn't very happy with it. Um, I started a more ambitious project where I started stealing stuff from Lindsay Cooper. And here, um, so Lindsay's implementation of PAR um, uses a uh, version of a Chase and Lev work stealing deck that I, took, I stole and implemented, I think, gosh, 2010? I think I, I attended uh, Nepples in 2010. Were you there? Yeah. And it would have been longer ago than that. Probably. Maybe 2008? Yeah. yeah. I think I, yeah, I attended Naples in 2008. It, it was up yeah, at uh, Miami. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I was there too. Okay. <laughs> so I ran into the chase there, and I'd already implemented his deck once. So I ported it all over to Haskell after talking to him. And then I didn't get it right, and it didn't work. And Ryan Newton spent a bunch of time making it actually have all the right fences at all the right times and everything. So now we have a very efficient Chase Lev work scaling deck. Is that day Chase? Uh, I think yes. so. Yes. And um, I spent a little bit of time going back and making it more Haskelly and baked it in here. But then when Lindsay Cooper came to him as a grad, came to Ryan as a grad student, she started building her Parmonad for doing this stuff. And the Parmonad actually uses the descendant of that original deck. Um, it's a very incestuous community. Um, that now works. So she, what she has is a, um, this is sort of my re-implementation of her ideas, this notion of like some kind of fiber. I think she called it a closed par or something like that. Um, which says, given whatever context I have for the worker, we'll do an IO action and then builds up a par monad, which is basically a CVS fiber. So you have access to the current continuation, you can shove it on this work stealing deck and other people can steal it. Um, you can spawn and um, do whatever in this scheme. And so by the time you're done here, you can build an implementation of something very much like the MIT Silk stuff, right? Silk. CILK, Silk. Right. Um, the problem that I have with this approach is that it doesn't work very well for Haskell. And that is that if I look at I-bars here, my I-bar reads have to read into par. Because you, you wind up building a whole custom scheduler that knows how to, to do things. I can't have this be an I-bar A goes to A. Because it gives you, if it gave you a pure value, what, what do you have to do? You have to block waiting on it. But if you're blocking waiting on it, and you're one of these computational threads, who's doing your work? Right? So that you would have to return your fiber into the pool, which means that anything that would ever block in Haskell, a lazy language where we block all the time for black holes and whatever, would have to um, relinquish control. It just doesn't fit with the language way. So this really bugged me, because I really liked the scheduler, um, not, not least because of having written the deck that was sitting way down at the bottom of it originally. Um, so... I've been, I've been having this sort of crisis of faith in terms of implementation technology ever since. So this was the second stab at implementing this. And so I've got this current, or concurrent, um, so, so the Haskell parallelism primitives were supposed to be run using a decent scheduler and I... The, M, the existing MVAR, the basic MVAR machinery. And not the basic MVAR machinery, but the, the basic pure... Um, we have Sparks, but the problem with sure, Sparks can be dropped off the, like, there, there's no guarantee that a Spark runs. And, and sparks, don't act as, don't, sparks don't act as garbage collection routes, etc. So you really need to use real threads and real MVARs. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that the PAR strategy can never really be made async safe, because once you've CPS something, there's no good way to make everything uh, able to deal with masking and async exceptions. So these are, these are the problems that started to come to light as I was playing with this. Because the Spark mechanism really should be embedding all of the scheduling nonsense, right? Except, yes. Except that they can get garbage collected. Yeah, the problem is that, that um, Sparks don't act as garbage collection routes. There's all sorts of stuff that get in your way of actually trying to use them as any sort of heavy lifting. I have got my speculation library that gets away with them, but that's about it. So here, my Parmonad is... I, uh, 
Oh, where is it? It's on the screen somewhere. Right there. New type par is IO! With a bunch of random crap shoved in front. Okay? So in the, in the, new, in the brave new world, I'm using M bars again. Okay? We've gone full circle back to all the stuff that we already know. They came from the original concurrent, etc. parallel Haskell work. And now my I bars, which are now, I think, called concurrent promise right now, because I went back to the vocabulary that I like. So I'm writing the library. I can do that. Um, so now you can make a promise, you can read from a promise, and you can write to a promise. But reading from a promise is a pure thing. Okay? And a promise internally holds on to some M bar machinery, and I wind up um, using unsafe duplicable perform IO and unsafe, you know, all sorts of crazy unsafe things behind the scenes, right? But I can expose it to you in a form that is safe as long as the EEC instances are safe, you know? So this is the form of promise that I'm using today. This is the form of I bar that I have up over there. Okay, and in the process of building all of this stuff, I started realizing that I needed better concurrency primitives than Haskell gives us. Um, so this is where we can go very, very far down the rabbit hole of implementing uh, capability local variables and trying to make it so that I have M bars that act like they're not running in the threaded runtime, but are only able to be used within a capability, and some other <laughs> things that I've been building to try and make faster things that don't pay, pay for compare and swap overhead. Um, but the, the, there's, there's, a, there's a big step here from going from the par monad with the custom scheduler with the work stealing deck that can be really optimal as long as you stay in this little world to this larger world. And that is that it's not immediately obvious how to execute any algorithm that behaves well under contention. So there's a whole continuum of lock-free and wait-free, et cetera, data structures out there. So at one level, I'm just going to sketch real quickly, we have this notion of like something that's obstruction-free. So if nobody else is running, I will finish in finite time. Yay. And then the next level up, we have these things called lock-free. Says that even if everybody else is running, somebody will finish in finite time. Okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> um, we can move up from there to wait-free, and this is where most people stop. At wait-free, everybody finishes in finite time, and we're all happy. But it would be nice to know what finite means. So there are these things called wait-free bounded algorithms. And these are usually defined in terms of the number of threads that we have that are executing. So when we, almost every one of these execution models assumes a fixed number of working threads. Right, in order to go from a lock-free algorithm to a wait-free algorithm, what you usually wind up doing is you wind up making a fixed array of helpers or something like that. Um, let's just look at what lock-free would do. Like, let's say I wanted to do a lock-free linked list where I can const onto the front of the linked list. What would you do? Well, you'd say, here's my linked list, and it's pointing off to the next thing, right? And I've got my head pointer. So what do I do? I make a new cell. I read what this value is. I put it here. And then I try to atomically, in one fell swoop, compare and swap to point this thing here, assuming that this pointer is the actual value of this pointer. Right? That's what compare and swap does. And if we got it right, Congratulations, we made it in one move, right? Um, but if we failed, it's because somebody else managed to get ahead of us and stick themselves in the list down. So what we have to do is um, read this point here, then try and compare and swap. But we could lose again, and again, and again, and again, and again. We have no guarantee of progress. But if we're losing, it's because somebody else is winning at least. Right. Okay, so that's where lock-free algorithms come from. But then moving up from compare and swap to try and do something wait free, what we would typically do is this. I would make like a set of, if I have n workers, I'd make an array of size n. And then um, 
what I would do is I would write sort of a help record in here, and you have to help everybody out. And by the time you're done, you can set up a bunch of guarantees that make this whole thing not ever have to do this compare and swap nonsense in this right in this way. But that requires me to know n, and it requires me to scan a whole array of size n. But if my if I'm growing in with an unbounded number of Haskell threads, n doesn't really fit very well, and I can't make cake, I can't make this a list, or I've got the same damn problem again. <laughs> So I'm, 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 I'm hosed in almost every scenario. There is um, a middle ground where you sort of have an array. I think I, I've always heard it called diffraction mask. You have an array and you sort of stick your... Yeah, you, you, you hash the is thing the, to... Is the exponential backup and then you pull it out and, and try again if, if someone else... Is yeah, you can, you can do like a multiple of the thing and hash your thread ID and do a bunch yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it tur turns out in real life people write obstruction-free algorithms and then do think things like this that work with high probability. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to get down to the point where I'll have a weight-free population oblivious solution for a lot of my problems with high probability. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in the formal WHP sense, right? Um, but here, just to get this n, the simplest solution that I know of is that I have an n that grows with much slower, which is the number of capabilities that we have. So Haskell uses these things, th these green threading solutions internally inside of GHC where what we do is we multiplex our actual threads and they run on these things we call capabilities, which are basically our cores. Um, and threads are free to move from capability to capability. You can create a thread pinned to a capability, but there's not out of the box a way to pin a thread retroactively. So I added that primitive um, by writing some custom Z minus minus and some fun stuff. And now what I can do is I can say, hey, thread, you're pinned to your current capability. And now what I can do is I can, if I make it so that what I do is I write a custom primitive for GHC, for anything that I actually want to do that needs to look atomic to the runtime system, as long as it happens within a capability, as long as it lives on like one of these capability local variables, what I can do is I can grab the capability local variable that's associated with the capability that my thread is now associated with, because I can pin the thread to its current capability. I can now work with a local resource that no other capability is going to be executing, and that each primitive can access it as if it was in an obstruction-free world. So it, it's, it's very much in the same spirit of what you were just getting at, which is that we, we break it down into the number of cores, we try to work obstruction-free within the core, and then try to build a I'm trying to build a weight-free algorithm across the... But there you actually do know it, and so you don't have to worry about probability anymore. Yes. This one. <laughs> but um, an example of something where I do need probability is, let's say that I wanted to make a growable hash set. I could use, like, Haskell-style stuff, but actually it works out to be much better if I use, like, um, just a straight-up... Um, like con conventional imperative hash table, where I use linear probing. I probe the next member, and the next member. And linear probing is usually bad, but if you use a good hash function, then I can get O1 expected chain length with high probability. And I can say that when I go to observe somebody, I put a listener in on the node. Or when I go to insert something, I put it in. And it's a series of compare and swaps but the number of contenders for a given position is O1 with high probability regardless of number of um, participants. So this gives me weight-free population oblivious with high probability growable hash sets with listeners under this scheme. Now it fails to be weight-free because we actually have the, the notification process, but the actual structure itself doesn't block. Okay. If that so made any sense. Tell me how you resize that hash table. The way, the way that you, <laughs> to resize the hash table you can maintain the new larger hash table, and whenever you go to access something, readers help. And if they don't help, then this thing stays alive for longer. Um, okay, so that gives like that was just like an example of like trying to build those smarter building blocks of a growable set and these things because I don't want end users to have to build these. I want to build these for people, right. make them fast, make them work really well. Um, get the handful of experts that we can get in the room to try and figure out how they should work. Um, try to update the core Haskell primitives that I need to work a bit smarter to get away with a lot less locking. And um, 
I think that if we do, if we can get the sort of constant factors here right, and some of these things are actually asymptotic, not just constants, obviously, like the moving to weight free, gets us scaling up to more cores. And we can get all of these other factors right in terms of the execution engine, then um, this actually has the, the potential to be something interesting, right? I'm trying to scale it up from hundreds of cells and propagators to millions or more, you know? And um, that's what's sort of, like once I realized that that was possible is when this actually kind of took off for me. So something that jumped out at me is um, you've got these data types with this monotone and uh, item code and properties. Uh, depending on how you describe exactly what sort of operations you have, you end up with things that are consensus number two. So you can get away with implementing them with weaker. Oh, yes. Uh, we don't need linearizability. That's the other right. thing. Right. So, so Hurley, he uses linearizability as his condition for how to right. implement all of these sort of weight, this entire hierarchy. Um, but that, I don't actually care about linearizability. I care about this ev eventual consistency, the strong eventual consistency condition. Um, There's also the sort of add and then complete, I guess, sort of add stuff and then run a run something that propagate propagators again. Yeah. Uh, that, that sort of looks at the data set and says, okay, complete this, add more stuff, maybe. Hmm. Um, and if you work out the algebra, it ends up being as long as you're inside a complete, you can drop all the other completes and reorder the adds arbitrarily. Hmm. So... I think you can get away with uh, with sort of cues. Uh, basically, you just you, you take you take a, a classic uh, deck, long free deck, throw away the deck, and keep the diffraction mask only, and that actually works. Because if you collide, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you collide, you just basically you pull, pull the order. thing out, add on your operation, because adds can be. Really yeah, I don't care about the I don't that. care about the order of, of operations. So a lot of things that right. normally are really hard to maintain in the presence of linearizability conditions um, you, become easier. So you can I, can, I can theoretically merge, beat yeah. a lot of the, the bounds that make an assumption that I'm not making. You can arbitrarily merge all the operations and then just as long as you guarantee that, that, that it gets completed after you've, uh, after you've added something. All right, so I'll go for like a couple more minutes and then, Sorry. I'll, then I'll let people go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... How many people here know Connell Elliott's work on UNAM? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time we get done, once par runs to a pure value, like if we look at par, there's a run par computation that says, hey, look, if, if this par is going to yield a deterministic answer, I can just run it and give you back, a, I can give you an answer. It looks like a pure computation. It runs like ST, but you can fork. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But you can't use ST variables, you can only use these I bars to communicate. So now, like again, the whole goal here was to make everything deterministic, even though you've got fork join stuff going on, right? So now, I can come over to something like, I don't know, this is actually not very pretty code right now, but let's do like a concurrent Boolean. Let's make a very, very lazy AND. Okay. Right? Well, what I can do here, is I can run a par computation that builds an empty promise, forks off two computations, one of them looks at the first value, and if it's true, then it checks to see if the second one is true, and then writes into the, into the other promise true. Otherwise, it writes into the promise false. And then the other thread is blocking on Y, waiting to write into the, into the promise. So we're sort of racing, waiting these two things together, and I, I give you back um, what I do is I, I make these threads weak because if I hold on to the threads themselves, then these will never get blocked indefinitely on M bar kind of exceptions. So I need to get these out of scope. So now I'm, I only have weak threads in scope. So these threads can be garbage collected and all sorts of fun things can happen to me. And when we're down here, we will try to read from the promise kill the threads, and give you back the answer. So this is the result, Boolean. This is like pi calculus if you made every single thing a thread. Yes. Okay. Um, so this would let me build like a maximally lazy and. Or, uh, so if I was, okay. I started with this, this originally began in the par world, right? Where this was an I bar S bool to an I bar S bool to, an I, to a par S of I bar S bool. 
right? And then what happened was, these became reads of an Ivar, right? Uh -huh. At which point in time, this was an if read Ivar uh -huh. X. But it doesn't actually need to read from an Ivar. This works for anything uh -huh. that's like uh, lazy computation. I could block waiting for this thing to compute. So this collapsed down to X. This one collapsed down to X. Mm -hmm. This became the run par of the, of the resulting computation, so this collapsed down to an actual just a Boolean. Mm -hmm. So by the time we're done, this is a monotone function. It's just not one that you could actually write out of the parts that we have normally available to us. <laughs> right? And now the, the forking and getting rid of this stuff, the, the traverse thread stuff, this was the stuff that I started to steal from Connell, from Unamp, to try and make this thing more efficient. And run par is actually smarter about dealing with when um, an exception is thrown from inside of here and percolates out, this would otherwise come back and you'd have MVARs with nobody writing to them. And yeah, so Connell, Connell is, was trying to solve a slightly harder problem, actually. Absolutely. In that he wanted you to be able to say uh, undefined and fal false is false. Yes. Um, and so he wanted to that actually run works here. undefined, have undefined, like throw its terrible exception, right. catch the terrible exception, bury it in bury it six. The nice thing is that happens in this little forked off thread. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it actually works here to do undefined and false is false. Yeah. So, but but that's what the run par stuff was all for. Yeah. It's for. So he he builds it up in, in sort of the very general combinators. Right now I'm still kind of programming with bare metal. Here, right? I'm building up my primitives and making sure that I can express the stuff that came out of the unam machinery. And then, if I just had like a trigger or something like that, um, then what I'm really interested in is waiting for this or this to terminate. I don't care which. And I can actually build unam out of the machinery here. <laughs> Just, ah, uh, okay, that didn't all up for some reason. Um, but anyways, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. So I am happy to continue talking about this stuff with people later on at like Cambridge Brewing Company or what have you, but I think I have far um, <laughs> overrun the time slot that I, I wanted to talk through anyway, so. Um, that's the bulk of what I wanted to get through. There's some interesting problems where it turns out that constraint propagation or constraint programming is a form of propagation, it, it, just like we did with SAT solving when we talked about SAT solving as sort of a SAT problem. It turns out that the original AC3 algorithm for doing constraint propagation from the 70s or 80s turns out to actually be solve the propagator problem for it. Um, that's establishing arc consistency is constraint propagation, and those are with sets that you shrink rather than grow. We use intersection rather than... And so you need uh, backtracking, right? And I'm not sure where you gave up... Oh, I didn't give you... I didn't, get, I didn't actually describe the backtracking except by talking about it as a order where what I have is the epoch number and then the set of constraints that I've built up. And then whenever I have to backtrack, what I do is I increase the epoch number and then shrink the set of the things that I'm working with. So by the time you get done with this, you can describe a constraint propagator, a, a, like an arc in a constraint propagation graph as just another propagator, where what you're doing is you're propagating initially between domains, right? If we think about this in the, in the context of SAT, what we're saying is that um, SAT is a very weak constraint propagation domain, right? Well, it, it's, a very, it's a very specific one, right? Um, where we've got these two watch literal schemes and uh, Conflict-directed clause learning to help us out, right? Um, on the other hand, when we start doing constraint propagation, we get to very specific things. When you start doing like all different checks, what do we do? We do like bipartite graph matching algorithms and stuff that, that can take advantage of the special structure of this particular problem. Um, and the stuff that I don't really have time to show here is that we can view like a linear programming problem as another lattice to work on. So if I have a linear programming problem and I don't cut off the like, you know, if you have a linear pro programming problem, you have some sort of convex polytope in space, and one of the vertex vertices will be where your solution lies, right? Or your, a, one of the, a solution will be at one of the vertices, right? As long as you don't cut off the sort of critical vertex, like adding more cuts to this polytope just makes the, shrinks the problem, makes it more defined. Mm -hmm. 
you can actually view this under appropriate views as a lattice, and we can start borrowing machinery from relaxations of this stuff to figure out cuts to solve integer linear programs and stuff like that. So this is a whole other tangent that I do not have time to go through right now. Um, but uh, I, I did that, I realized I kind of went on a different tangent than you were asking. Um, yeah, I, I was actually at where, uh, in the end, uh, there's there's no backtracking uh, in, in, right, in, the, in this uh, parallel. Uh, well, there can be backtracking. What you do okay. is you build the, you build the lattice, you, 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 you take the whole system and you, you augment the lattice. Out. Okay. Well, so, so the well, thing he just showed us, substituted for backtracking, substituted parallel execution. Yes. Right? That's so one way to do it. So instead of backtracking when the left end uh, uh, argument went wrong, you just evaluated both arguments in parallel, okay. and whoever won the race uh, got to define the result. So that, that, is, that is one way we can do this. Another way that we can do this is we can do something where what I'll do instead is I'll take this. I'll augment every lattice in my entire problem with, a, with an epoch number. So here's my version number, right? And whenever I find myself in some unsolvable subproblem, instead of blowing up the world, I'll just blow up this epoch. Then I'll figure out what subset of this thing is consistent, remove the, like, add something that teaches me so I never go back into this, this path again, bump the version number, and then start propagating again. As long as, my, as long as this is like a lexicographical order where the version number means that th these nodes dominate everything that we had before, as long as it's a direct sum of this, the, the, the subsequent epochs over the old epoch, then we'll immediately climb into the next epoch and continue, continue processing. Um, and if you follow that epoch scheme, um, in Alexi's paper there's a, um, a system where he talks about functional reactive programming that way, where you're basically watching time move forward as your epoch. And I'm actually rather partial to this framing of functional reactive programming because I've not been a fan of functional reactive programming to date. Because if you look at an equation in an FRP setting, it's causal. If you say that x equals y plus z, that says that y and z determine x. It's not an equation in the mathematician sense, right? But if I write it out as a propagator network that's fully bidirectional like that, then I can push information both forward and backwards through. And Alexi has a bunch of stuff in there about probabilistic programming, which is um, also, I guess, near and dear to his current. <laughs> I never did nail that. I, yeah, I, I, there, there's some issues there. But. Is that the appealing to your boss base? As in, I threw this into the paper to appeal to the PI. <laughs> <laughs> no, the PI at the time didn't care about probabilistic programming. Oh, all right. Mm. Um, and once you kill idempotence, you can actually do automatic differentiation and some other problems. So this was basically, I started throwing every problem that I wasn't smart enough to solve for the last seven years into a blender, um, figuring that I should try and solve them all at the same time, because that will make it easier. Um, Sometimes that works. What dis disturbs that me is that it's work. actually working to some extent. Sometimes if you make the problem harder, it gets easier. <laughs> So it, it shut off a lot of like blind avenues, and it let's let me steal a bunch of techniques from each one of them. So um, I guess that's that's probably the best way I have to think about about this space. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>